watching. And uh, hopefully the uh, Apple TV will catch up with us and you'll see some images show up on the screen eventually. Um, the name of our Torah portion is Ha'atzinu, and it begins in Deuteronomy chapter 32. But I want to get a little running start to that. Let's go back to chapter 31, because the song needs some introduction. Start in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 14. It says, Adonai spoke to Moses, Behold, your days are drawing near to die. Summon Joshua, and both of you shall stand in the tent of meeting, and I shall instruct him. So Moses and Joshua went and stood in the tent of meeting. Now, neither of them are priests, but they're standing inside the tent of meeting, inside the tabernacle. Adonai appeared in the tent, and a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood by the entrance of the tent. Adonai said to Moses, Behold, you will lie with your forefathers, but this people will rise up and play the harlot after the gods of the foreigners of the land, in whose midst it is coming. And it will forsake me and violate my covenant that I have sealed with it. My anger will flare against it on that day, and I will forsake them, and I will conceal my face from them, and they will become prey, and many evils and distresses will encounter it. It will say on that day, Is it not because my God is not in my midst? And you can also translate, Is it not because my God is not in me that these evils have come upon me? But I will surely have concealed my face on that day. In other words, he's still there, but he's hidden his face so they can't see him. Because of all the evil that it did, for it had turned to gods of others. So now, write this song for yourselves, you, Moses and Joshua, and teach it to the children of Israel. Place it in their mouths, so that this song shall be for me a witness against the children of Israel. So, with that in mind, God gives this song to Moses. God composes it, Moses writes it down, just like with all the Torah. He gives it to Moses and to Joshua, and then we go on down to verse 22. Moses wrote the song on that day, and he taught it to the children of Israel. He commanded Joshua, son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the children of Israel to the land that I have sworn to them, and I shall be with you. So it was that when Moses finished writing the words of this Torah onto a book until their conclusion, Moses commanded the Levites, the bearers of the Ark of the Covenant of Adonai, saying, Take this book of the Torah, and place it at the side of the Ark of the Covenant of Adonai, and it shall be there for you as a witness. And then we'll go on down to verse 30. Moses spoke the words of this song into the ears of the entire congregation of Israel until their conclusion. It's interesting. He's talking about the song, but he kind of skips to writing the Torah down, the Torah that we study throughout the year, and then goes back to the song. Okay. Yes, Adam, I see your hand up. I'm just curious, it's happened a couple of times, but particularly here in verse 26, my translation says the remainder is a witness against you, whereas the years it's got witness, I don't know if it's different, but the word is different. And it shall be there for you as a witness. Um, uh, well, witness, a testimony, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's a, the word aid, which means a witness or testimony, but it's not, it says, it's bacha la aid, for you or in you, a testimony, okay, a witness. Um, the word aid is uh, Zion Dalit. I don't know if you ever noticed, but on the banner that we had up during Yom Kippur, it says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, right? Shema ends with the letter ayin, and on the banner, the ayin is way oversized. Then the last word, ikhad, means one, and the dalit at the end is way oversized. That's because ayin and dalit, these two oversized letters, spell the word aid, witness. Because what is Israel's testimony and witness? That God is one. 
You know, there's no other gods to deal with, just the one. Okay, now I see Jason and Chris back there puzzled. Why don't you go over to the office? I think um, uh, Kevin might still be there. He might have a fix for this projector issue that we're experiencing. It turns it off, but it won't turn it back on. Hmm, that's very curious. Well, that's your assignment for this morning, Jason, to get to the bottom of that. <laughs> So if we don't have it, we don't have it. We still have the Torah in front of us, and we can do this. So here is how things start off. It says, Ha Azinu, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and may the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop like the rain. May my utterance flow like the dew. Now, if we had a, a, a graphic up here, you could see this, so you're just going to use your imaginations right now. But picture right here, there's a column of Torah script because the Torah scroll is written in columns. You have a column, about so wide. Then you've got another column, another column. It's written in columns, usually three to four columns on one sheet of parchment, and then the sheets are all stitched together. So when you're reading through chapter 31, it's one big wide column. But the moment you get to chapter 32, where the song begins, it skips a couple of lines and then it narrows down to two columns, a column on your right and then a column on the left. And you read the first line of the right-hand column and then the first line of the left-hand column. A line of the right, a line of the left. You go here then here, right, left, right, left. And the way Hebrew poetry works is that they don't use rhyming sounds, they use rhyming thoughts. So if you look at the first line of this song, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. That's the right. That's the spiritual. Right is spiritual. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Then the left is the, the physical. And may the earth hear the words of my mouth. So there are two thoughts that complement one another. The first half of the verse is on the right top, and then on the left column at the top is the second part of the verse. Verse 2 starts over on the right. May my teaching drop like the rain, then goes over to the left. May my utterance flow like the dew. Rain, dew. You see how they, they rhyme? Rain comes from above down. It's on the right. It's spiritual. Dew is something that just appears on the earth from the bottom up. Physical. You, you follow? And we go on through here. That's the way it works. Whatever thought is started in the right-hand column is then balanced over in the left-hand column. Right, left, right, left, all the way through until a certain point. You get to a certain point in this, this song when it starts talking about how rebellious Israel is. How Israel has turned against God. Now it's straight after foreign gods. Then guess what happens? Then the first thought's over on the left. And then the counter thought is on the next line on the, on the right. And then it starts on the, the left, and then the next one's over on the, on the right. It's all, it, there's, a, there's a theological term for this. It's called miscobobulation. It's totally miscobobulated. And all during the part of the song that talks about how rebellious Israel has been, how they sinned, rebelled against God, everything is, is, is goofed up. It's switched over. Left is right, and right is left. It's kind of like we were talking on Yom Kippur when the high priest would draw the lots. It's always a sign of good fortune when the goat, the Adonai, to the Lord came in the right hand and the one to Azazel came in the left. It's always considered a bad omen, considered a bad omen if those were reversed. And then in the song, everything becomes reversed. But then near the end, when it talks about how God appears and he brings judgment and then he corrects everything, then it goes back to things start on the right and finish on the left. It's, it's quite amazing as you read through this in the Hebrew, the way it appears in a Torah scroll to see this happen. If you have a printed uh, Torah, like a Chomish, you'll notice there are two columns. And if you look carefully, when you get down to about verse 15, then the verse numbers will swap over. Well, let's just read a bit. We'll just make a few comments as we go. Give ear, O heavens... And I will speak, and may the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop like the rain. May my utterance flow like the dew. Like storm winds upon vegetation, and like raindrops upon blades of grass. When I call out the name of Adonai, ascribe greatness to our God. It's based on this verse, when I call out the name Adonai, 
ascribe greatness to our gods. Based on that, that when we say the Shema, Hear, O Israel, Adonai, our God, Adonai is one. We then add another phrase, blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And that is based upon this verse. So when we call out with the name of Adonai, we then ascribe greatness to the Lord. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever. Okay? Another interesting thing, in this song, the four-letter name of God, yud heh vav -Heh, appears exactly eight times. Eight times. Eight is the number of life. And also, the word rock the word Zur. All right, what's going on up there? Oh, my goodness. Want to watch a movie? <laughs> That's got to be your iPad, Kevin. That's not mine. Yeah. Now you know what the preacher here is doing, okay? <laughs> okay, boy, people listen to this on the Internet. The tape's going, what in the world is going on at that place this morning? And we're not telling. All right. Verse 4, the rock, perfect is his work, for all his paths are justice. A God of faith without iniquity, righteous and fair is he. You know, right before the teaching, we sang the song, uh, the song of Moses, which comes right out of Revelation 15. And where it says, just and true are your ways, O Lord. That's based right on this song. It's part of the song of Moses. Verse 5, corruption is not his. The blemish is his children's. A perverse and twisted generation. And then a most unusual thing happens at this point. A most unusual thing happens. If we had our graphics up, you could see it. But the next line, right where verse uh, 5, be I'm sorry, verse, verse 6 begins, it has the letter hey just hanging out there. It's not a word, it's just a letter. It's just a letter hanging out there and it's written way oversized. Oh, here comes Jason. What's up? Go ahead and try to reconnect your iPad. Okay, it shows here that it is connected. Apple TV, yep, I'm connected. Like it says, corruption is not Grant's, the blemish is Jason's. That's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> now it says I'm connected here at this end. Wow. Okay. It's connected. Oh, I know the problem. I see it now. Does that change things? Yes. <laughs> Like it says, the corruption is Grant's, not Jason's. Yeah, so. All right. Shh. Ah, come on. Sheesh. There we are. Now, if you're not careful, I'm going to start this whole thing over. We're going to be here for hours. So you better be good. Okay. All right. Now you can, you can see what I was trying to explain. <laughs> Up here in this part, you can see this is, this is normal, a normal column width. But then as we move down, right here is verse 1. This is where the, the portion begins. Ha'atzinu. There is the first word of our portion. Okay. And um, it says, give ear, O heavens, and, uh, and I will speak. And then it moves over here. And the second part is, um, and may the earth hear the words of my mouth. And then it goes over. Verse 2 starts. So it starts over on the, it starts on the right, continues on the left. And then the right, the left, and then it goes down. It, uh, there are two couplets for verse 2. It goes on to verse 3. Now, right down here. This is the letter hey I was talking about. And let me just blow that up. You can go down here and you can see it really well. There's that letter hey. Notice it is written oversize and it's just hanging out there. It's not a word. Now what sound does the letter hey make? The rabbis say this is God's sigh. 
He just went, and he says, is it to Adonai that you do this? Oh, foolish and unwise people. You know, there are two kinds of sighs. There's the, oh, that was great, you know, or the, everything's awful. And that's the second kind. So God just sighs. And he says, is it to Adonai that you repay this? Oh, foolish and unwise people. Is he not your father, your buyer? That's the word there, the one who's, who's, who's uh, purchased you. Has he not created you and established you? Remember the days of yore. Understand the years of generation after generation. Ask your father, and he will relate it to you, and your elders, and they will tell you. When the Supreme One gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the children of man, he set the borders of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. That's very important. When you go to Genesis chapter 10, you'll find there that after the flood, uh, Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they had sons, and their sons had sons, and then they had sons, and it gives the entire family tree of the earth. And if you count up all the people groups there, they're exactly 70. 70. And then when you finish Genesis, you go to Exodus, after Abraham and, and Isaac and, and Jacob have lived, and Jacob has 12 sons. And, and then when you get to Exodus, or, I'm sorry, the end of Genesis, when Jacob descends into Egypt, how many souls descend into Egypt? 70 souls. In the world, there were 70 nations, and with Jacob, there were 70 souls. God says, I'm going to make a 71st nation. A 71st. I'm going to make it a new people. A brand new people. And this new people would be the people of Israel. And he says here, again, when the Supreme One, verse 8, gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the children of man into the 70 nations, he set the borders of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. See, now we want to think chronologically. We want to think, well, be God since the 70 souls came after the 70 nations, he must have established 70 Jewish souls because there are already 70 nations. No, 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 no. With God, there's no time. He knew how many souls he was going to bring into Egypt. 70 souls, I'm going to make 70 nations. I'm setting the inheritance of the world according to the souls of Israel. And then there's a, a fascinating, a fascinating passage then. It says in verse 9, For Adonai's portion is his people. Jacob is the measure of his inheritance. Jacob is the measure. Now the word that is used there is, right here I've got at the bottom, is the word hevel. And hevel means a rope. Jacob is the rope of his inheritance. What does that mean? Well, in ancient times, if they wanted to measure out a large piece of land, instead of just pacing it off or using a, a tape rule, they would take a rope of a certain length. Let's say you're going to make a football field, right? So you take a rope 50 yards long. You stretch it out, you got the width of the field. You stretch it this way, you stretch it that way a second time, you got the length, 100 yards. It makes it quick and easy. You understand? God is saying, Jacob is the rope. I used to measure out my inheritance. This is why the Bible puts so much emphasis on being grafted into Jacob or Israel. When we are grafted into Israel, we come within the measure of Jacob. There are a couple passages here where this word kevel is used, um, meaning to measure. Here are a couple. Psalm 16, 6. The kevel the ropes have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. In other words, when they stretched out the rope to measure my inheritance, wow, they picked a great spot. Just the right size. It's beautiful. Micah 2 5. Therefore, you shall have none that shall cast the hevel, the measuring line, upon a lot in the congregation of Adonai. Okay, so there's just a couple examples of where that word is used. But we go on. 
Verse 10, he discovered him in a desert land and desolation, a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He granted him discernment. He preserved him like the pupil of his eye. He, the Lord, was like an eagle arousing its nest, hovering over its young. You know, that word hovering is uh, yerachif. And uh, the first place it's used is when the Spirit of God, uh, merachifet, it hovered over the waters. He hovered when he created the world, but then he was hovering over this this one man, Abraham, when he's creating this people. And then over his children, spreading its wings and taking them, carrying them on its pinions. Adonai alone guided them, and no other God was with them. He would make him ride on the heights of the land and have him eat the ripe fruits of the fields. He would suckle him with honey from a stone and oil from a flinty rock. Now that word for stone there is not the word that's found eight times in this, this song. It's not the word zor. This is the word sela. Sela is the word applied to the rock. When Moses struck the rock and the water came out, that was the word sela. So he's talking about honey from a rock. Okay? And it's a reference to that. Yes, Andrew. Why is a pupil sometimes translated apple? It's basically the same word. Why it is, I don't know. But the apple of the eye, the little black center of the eye is called the apple. And uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I think you should find an answer for that. So next week, I'll ask a question. You can answer that one. Yeah, why don't you discover that? Because you're a researcher. Why don't you come up with an answer for that? That'd be great. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, that will teach you guys to ask questions today. Won't you? <laughs> no, seriously, please ask questions. And uh, if, if I have an answer, I'll be happy to share it. Um, he would suckle him with honey from a stone and oil from a flinty rock. And, and previously, I think it's in the book of Numbers, or early in Deuteronomy, we we're told that the rock that Moses struck was flint. And the word for flint in Hebrew is made up of the letters that spell Mashiach. And this is why Paul says that rock that followed them was Messiah. Butter of cattle and milk of sheep with fat of lambs, rams born in Bashan and he goats with wheat as fat as kidneys. And you would drink blood of grapes like delicious wine or fermented wine. Yeshurun became fat and kicked. And then the next verse is where the left becomes the right and the right becomes the left and the whole song is miscombobulated. There's a powerful lesson here. God loves us and wants to bless us. You love your children, you want to bless them and give them things, but what happens when you give your children all that you would like to give them? They start to kick. Every child's ever been spoiled will start to kick. And who do they kick? The very ones who are spoiling them. They may not kick them with their feet, but they'll kick with their speech, with their words, with their attitudes. We're not very good at receiving blessings from God. Oh, we want them all right. But because of our hearts, they can ruin us. What's God supposed to do? Not bless us at all? No, what he does, he gives us blessing, but he gives us instruction on how to handle the blessing. He gives instructions on humility and on obedience and gratitude along with the blessing. But we like the blessing. We don't like the instruction and the self-discipline that goes with it. And you know how it is when you have a baby, you just lavish your love, your affection. You buy all these, these fancy clothes that the baby can't even appreciate. But just, you know, you buy it the best, the toys and, the, and you decorate the nursery room and everything. Just, you just give everything to it because the baby can't give anything back. But later down the road, you have to start bringing discipline into the baby's life. Right? That's the way we're made. In a sinless world, that wouldn't happen. With Yeshua, he grew from an infant into a man. He never required that. He never required that, but all of us do. And Israel is being described here as an individual, and, and Israel required discipline. They, the, the love and the blessings that God lavished on them, 
they didn't handle very well. And so the next passage, you became fat, you became thick, you became corpulent, and there's a specific spiritual insight for each of those, but we're not going to get into that this morning. And it deserted God its maker, it was contemptuous of the rock of its salvation. You ever watch a really spoiled brat kid and how they mouth off to their parents? Teach them, teach, they treat them with utter disrespect. And the parents just keep giving to them. Now, God is a perfect parent. And his kids went through some real turmoil. So if you're raising your kids the best you know how, and they go through a real time of turmoil, just remind yourself, God's a perfect father. And his kids didn't turn out all that great either for a while. Now, with that said, there are right ways and wrong ways to raise your kids. And you can either build problems into their lives, or you can deal with problems in their lives. Make sure you know what the difference is. We had to have a couple practice children before we figured out how to do it right. But we <laughs> Oh my goodness, did I learn a lot about myself for my kids. But uh, it goes on, verse 16. Now, these next verses that we're reading, remember the left and right are, are reversed. The thoughts will start over on the left and be completed on the right. Everything goes from the physical to the spiritual, which is backwards. They would provoke his jealousy with strangers. They would anger him with abominations. They would slaughter the demons without power, gods whom they knew not. Newcomers recently arrived, from your, uh, whom your fathers did not dread. You ignored the rock who gave birth to you and forgot God who produced you in labor. That's what the phrase brought you forth means. It means to, with labor pains brought you forth. Did you ever notice that when God brought Israel out of Egypt, they came out on that 10th plague. Their deliverance was preceded by nine labor pains. Okay? And then the 10th one, they just, they just shot out, Right? And just like uh, uh, the gestation period for a child is, is nine months, then the baby comes forth. Israel, there were nine plagues, and the tenth one, Israel came forth. You ignored the rock who gave birth to you and forgot God who produced you in labor. Adonai will see and be provoked by the anger of his sons and daughters. And he will say, I shall hide my face from them and see what their end will be. Now, if God seems especially angry with Israel, it's because they're his kids. I mean, other people's kids can, can get me a little steamed, but not like my own. Right? Why? Because I love my kids more than I love yours. Yours are great. I love mine more. Okay? Okay. And mine make me really angry, a lot more than yours do. Or at least they did. They've grown up now. They're, they're great. For they are a generation of reversals, children whose faithfulness is not in them. They provoked me with a non-God, angered me with their vanities. So shall I provoke them to jealousy with a non-people? With a foolish nation shall I anger them. You ever wonder why God had set Israel aside for a while and grafted into Gentiles? We're that foolish nation. We're the non-people who have now been made a people. You now, if we were to pull the people here, you'd be from probably all 70 nations mentioned in Genesis. But he's called us out of all peoples and all nations. And he's made us into a people. A non-people has become a people. A foolish nation is gaining wisdom. The things he's hidden, he's hidden the secret things from God from the, the wise and understanding and revealed them to babies. Babies in our understanding. Think about that. Think about that. That's amazing. For fire will have been kindled in my nostrils and blazed to the lowest depths. It shall consume the earth and its produce and set ablaze what is found on the mountains. In other words, all those things that were blessings to you before are going to go up in smoke. It, I shall accumulate evils against them. My arrows shall I use up against them. Now notice the word arrows. I want you to think about bows and arrows for a moment. That'll play a little bit later in the, in the teaching. 
bloating of famine, battles of flaming hunger or flaming demons. You can translate it either way. Cutting down by the contagious disease or by the noontime demon. You can translate it either way. And the teeth of beasts shall I dispatch against them with the venom of those that creep on the earth. On the outside, the sword will bereave, while indoors there will be dread. Even a young man, even a virgin, a suckling with the gray-haired man. I had said, I will scatter them. I will cause their memory to cease from man. Were it not that the anger of the enemy was pent up, lest the tormentor misinterpret, lest they say, our hand was raised in triumph, and it was not the Lord who accomplished all this. In other words, when Israel's enemies start to say, oh, God has left them. In fact, God, their God of Israel doesn't even exist. We're the ones who had victory over them. God says, not so quick. Not so quick. Verse 29. Were they wise, they would comprehend this. They would discern it from their end. For how could one pursue a thousand? In other words, how could one enemy pursue a thousand of Israel? And two, cause a myriad to flee, if not that their rock had sold them, and Adonai had delivered them. For not like our rock is their rock. That's an interesting phrase. Not like our rock, the rock of Israel, is their rock, the rock of the nations. You know, every life is built on some kind of a rock, an invisible rock. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you've built your life on something that in your heart you think is solid and real. Some people build their, their lives on the rock of their, their own magnificence, their own abilities, their own strengths, their own looks, their own intelligence. But that rock is not like God, the rock of the word. Some build their lives on the rock of wealth. Some build their lives on the rock of false theology or atheism. But every life is built on something invisible. But there's only rock that's truly a rock. And that rock is mentioned eight times in this, in this song. And God, yad heh vav is mentioned eight times in this song. Who do you think the real rock is? It's God. For not like our rock is their rock, yet our enemies judge us. For their vine is from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, so clusters of bitterness were given them. Serpent's venom is their wine, the poison of cruel vipers. Is it not revealed with me, sealed in my treasuries? Mine is vengeance and retribution at the time when their foot will falter. For the day of their catastrophe is near, and future events are rushing at them. When Adonai will have judged his people, he shall silently, he shall relent regarding his servants. When he sees that enemy power progresses and none is saved or assisted, he will say, Where is their God, the rock in whom they sought refuge? The fat of whose offerings they would eat. They would drink the wine of their libations. Let them stand and help you. Let them be a shelter for you. See now that I, I am he, and no God is with me. I put to death, and I bring to life. I inflict wounds, and I will heal. And there is no snatcher from my hand. And after that phrase, in verse 40, Guess what? The right goes back to the right. The left goes back to the left. And everything goes back to the way it was at the beginning. For I shall raise my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever, if I sharpen my lightning sword and my hand grasps judgment, I shall return vengeance upon my enemies. This is not Israel. This is against Israel's enemies, God's enemies. And upon those that hate me shall I bring retribution. I shall intoxicate my arrows, there's arrows again, with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh because of the blood of corpse and captive, because of the earliest depredations of the enemy. In other words, God's saying, my kids might make me really mad, but there's one thing that makes me more mad than my own kids, and that's the people who hurt my kids. You follow? 
So if your father's heart gets really angry at your kids because they get out of line, and it gets even more angry at the ones who hurt your children, well, that's how God's heart is too. You're reflecting the image of God. Now, the way you handle that, you, you, you act it out, may not be so godly. But that tendency, the anger that's born out of love, is a very real thing. Verse 43. O nations, sing the praises of his people. Whoa. Won't that be, won't that be something when you hear, when we hear our president and Ahmadinejad and, and all the Holocaust deniers sing the praises of God's people? Whoa, that's going to be a day to live for. For he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will bring retribution upon his foes, and he will kippur. He'll atone, he'll appease, he'll cover his land and his people. And you come to the end of the song. Moses came and spoke all the words of the song in the ears of the people. He and Hosea, son of Nun. And we could take time to talk about why Joshua is now goes back to the original spelling without the Yud. It is Hosea instead of Yahashua. But we're not going to get into that today. Moses concluded speaking all these words to Israel. He said to them, apply your hearts to all the words that I testify against you today, with which you are to instruct your children. Be careful to perform all the words of this Torah, for it is not an empty thing for you. Now, yours may say an empty word. In Hebrew, the word for word and the word for thing are the same words, the word devar. In the Hebrew class, I teach with some kids on Monday mornings. Uh, that was their vocabulary, one of their vocabulary words. And I asked them, I said, why do you think God designed that the word for thing and the word for word are the same word? And we started talking about it, and one of the kids got it. It's because God's word created everything, and everything is a product of God's speech. So the word for thing, the word for word is the same word. So, it is not an empty thing for you. It is your life. And through this matter shall you prolong your days on the land to which you cross the Jordan to possess it. Now, we've gone through the song. We got a little run up to the song of Moses. And we read a little bit past the song of Moses. But what is missing there's one huge, major, glaring omission in this whole thing. Can you figure out what it is? I can wait as long as you can. <laughs> Think about it. Need a clue? I'll give you a clue. Here's some verses that we read. 3119, now therefore write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths. So Moses wrote the song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. 3130, then Moses spoke the words of the song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. 3244, Moses came and recited all the words of the song in the hearing of the people, he and Joshua, the son of Nun. What's missing? What? I heard it. When did they say it? they? No. They didn't sing it. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Where in the world did they ever sing this thing? It's never sung. He writes it. He teaches it. He speaks it. He recites it. But nowhere does it ever, ever say in this whole passage that they sang it. And then you come to Revelation 15, 1 to 4. Then I saw another sign in heaven. Great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. In other words, we've reached the part in the Song of Moses where the right goes to the right, the left to the left, and God begins to pour out his judgment, his arrows and his sword upon the enemies of Israel. And that's where we are in Revelation. For with them... The wrath of God is complete, finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. Every time you see water and fire mixed together, your God's presence is there. In fact, the word shim, name, 
is made out of a shin, which is a picture, pictures fire, and mem, whose name means water. Okay, we could go on. In fact, one of the teachings I did on this passage on, on Ha'atzinu, um, last time or the time before, we, we took quite a bit of time to look at where fire and water are found together in the scriptures. You always find God's presence. I mean, how about John when he sees Yeshua on the island of Patmos? He looks in Yeshua's eyes and they were what? Flames of fire. But when he spoke, it was the voice of many waters. Fire and water again. It's uh, it Watch for that theme. And also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God. I can understand just said harps, but it's harps of God. What are harps of God in their hands? And they sang the song of Moses, Ha'atzinu. Now the song of Moses is not Exodus 15, the song of the sea. And I have in the past mistakenly referred to the song of the sea as being the song of Moses. It's not. That's Miriam's song. The song of Moses is Deuteronomy 32. What we just read is the song of Moses. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Saying, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Now, this can be confusing. When we sang the song earlier, it said, O King of the saints. Well, some Greek manuscripts say nations. Some Greek manuscripts say uh, saints, agio, the holy ones. There's a day coming when all the nations will be holy anyway, so who cares? They're both good. Who will not fear, O Adonai, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Here's my question. We know what the song of Moses is. We just read it. Now, where in the Bible do you find the song of the Lamb? Here is my question for you. I looked. I looked up any place the word song and lamb are used in the same verse, and this is the only verse. What's the song of the lamb? Exodus 15. Pardon me? Exodus 15. Nope, that's Miriam's song. But that's a good guess, Dennis. Mike. Kind of. But it would just be the song of Moses. They would say the song of Moses, which is the song of the Lamb, but doesn't say that. They sing the song of Moses, servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Let me tell you what's going on here. The song of Moses... are the lyrics. But remember, they never sang the song. A song, to be a song, needs more than lyrics. If you have lyrics, you've got a poem. What do you need to make it a song? You've got to have the melody. The song of the Lamb is the melody. Now let's think about this for a moment. Because it's not until Revelation, you have the song of Moses, and you have the Lamb, and then it's sung. We never see it sung until this point. You see, the melody is the spiritual part, the most spiritual, because it's something that's intangible. What is it when you take a poem? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What do you need to make that into a song? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Pitches. And some people who can read, read really well, have a tin ear. They cannot hear the music. They simply don't recognize the music. I remember a guy, a friend of mine, <clears throat> and uh, he comes over to visit once a year. Same guy. He sang in the choir in the Baptist church. He may still. And uh, we'll just call him Homer for the sake of not revealing the names of the guilty. Um, the, um, 
and he has absolutely no no ear for music. He's absolutely, utterly, completely tone deaf. And um, and he has this real low voice, and we'd be singing in the choir, we're all hitting our parts. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And he was so faithful, more faithful than we ever wish he would be. But <laughs> great guy, good guy, but you know, I've met a few people in my life who are absolutely, completely, totally tone deaf. They can read the lyrics, they don't hear the music. Now, what they think they're doing, I don't quite know. I've often wondered, I lay awake at bed and I wonder, tone deaf people, what do they hear when the rest of us are hearing music? And, um, but this is a powerful insight I want you to grasp. Because you see, some people, they have the Torah, and they don't have Yeshua. And they're all involved in obeying the Torah, keeping the commandments, keeping the traditions, crossing every T, dotting every I, and they don't hear the music at all. And we know of people who have left the Messiah and follow the Torah, and they don't hear the music, and their lives are devoid of music, because the melody is completely spiritual. On the other hand, a lot of people love the melody. They don't know the words. And their lives are kind of la, 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 la. <laughs> to have a song, you have to have both. You have to have both. I want to show you something to you. You know, back at the end of the Song of Moses where it says, uh, afterwards it says, and this is not an empty thing for you. It says this is not an empty thing for you, right? That word empty is the word rake. Resh, kof. It appears exactly twice in the Bible. Two times. It's found once here when it is not an empty thing. In other words, this Torah, the words of this Torah, it is not an empty thing. The Torah is not empty. You know where the other place that word is found? In Genesis 37:24, they have Joseph. They're about to throw him in a pit. And it says the pit was empty. Then they take Joseph out of the pit. It stayed empty. Now put these two together. Joseph, who more than any person in the entire Hebrew Scriptures represents the life of Yeshua. You know, hated by his brothers, goes among the Gentiles, takes a Gentile bride. During seven years of tribulation, his brothers come to him. He recognizes them. They don't recognize him, though. And during the seven years of tribulation, they are reconciled. I mean, and there, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of parallels. Joseph, his life parallels the life of Yeshua more than any person in the entire Old Testament. In fact, it's no coincidence that Yeshua is called Yeshua ben Yosef. Jesus, son of Joseph. Mary's husband, Jesus' adopted father, is named Joseph. No coincidence. And so when it comes to Joseph, there's an empty pit. He's put in for a short time and taken out. Our Joseph, our deliverer, our Yeshua, was put in an empty tomb for a short time and then taken out. So you've got a choice here. If you don't believe Yeshua is in the Torah because he's not the Messiah, then he's still in a pit somewhere. He's still in a grave. But if, like me, you believe he arose in that grave, where do you find him now? You find him in the Torah. Remember after Yeshua rose from the dead, he's, he's walked with the disciples to, the, to Emmaus? And there was nothing wrong with their eyes. And he hadn't changed his appearance, but they didn't recognize him. It just simply says in the King James, I love the way it says it, it says their eyes were holden. In other words, God just simply did not permit them to recognize the one they were walking with. This familiar friend, he did not allow them to recognize him. Why? I mean, and so Yeshua spends the whole day revealing himself to them. All he had to say is, look, guys, hands, feet, you know, side. It's me. Recognize my voice. Look at me. But he didn't do that. He reveals himself instead to them through the words. It says, starting with the Torah and the prophets and the writings. 
the Tanakh, the three parts of the Hebrew Scriptures. He revealed himself through that. Why? Because that is how he reveals himself today. This is why he says, you know, and then times it says, some people say, the Messiah, he's there, he's there. He says, don't believe him. Don't go trying to look for me physically. I'm here. I'm right here. The Torah is not an empty thing. The tomb is. The Torah is not. And so, people who don't see Yeshua in the Torah, they see him still in the grave. That's where he is. I see the grave as empty. But the Torah is not. He's the melody that goes with the words. He's the melody that makes the words come alive. You know, you can take the same poem and you can, you can sing those lyrics with a real slow minor key and it sounds like a, a funeral dirge. Or you can put something real quick and, and happy and has a lot of pop to it and it sounds like a, like a jingle for a commercial. And if we don't have the melody... We don't really know the spirit of the words coming across the page. But some people have an ear for the music. They can hear Yeshua's voice. They can see him, and they, there he is. And they read through, and oh, the rock, that's Yeshua. The flinty rock that was struck, and out came the living water. And here it's called honey. That's my Yeshua. And we see him everywhere. We come to the Torah, and it's like... There he is. We're like on the road to Emmaus, but we know who's talking to us. The Torah is not an empty thing. Isn't that amazing? When, when I read books and commentaries on the Torah, and you can tell they don't know the music, I'm really bored with that book. But when I read by an author who hears the music, they know the song of Yeshua. Then they can sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Because it's the same song, lyrics and melody. And uh, I want to go back to one thing here, then I see Steve has his hand up. What do you think the harps of God are? Harps of God. I mean, God's getting ready to pour out these, he's sending these angels, sending out these bold judgments. These are the last judgments on the earth. After that, it's all done. And so they're playing these harps of God. I don't think they're singing you know, like slow praise music and funeral music. Remember the arrows we found in the Song of Moses? Arrows are shot out of a what? A bow. What's a bow? You have a stout piece of wood, string tied across there really tight. You pull the string, you let go. That's exactly what you do with a harp. The imagery is the same. And what comes across as music to us is a weapon of arrows against the enemy. Isn't that amazing? That's what makes these the harps of God. This judgment's about to come when evil finally and once and for all is going to be done away from the earth. Oh, thank you, Father. But the people who find their fulfillment in evil, it's like, oh, oops, <laughs> we're in big trouble now. So what is music to the one is going to be pain and death to the other. But it's necessary. Which side are you going to be on? You're going to experience this as a, as a weapon coming against you or as a harp that is praise of God, lifting him up because his ways are perfect. And he's bringing judgment finally. And after that, he will be the king of the nations. And all nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. You know, God gets a lot of bad press. A lot of bad press. So there have been books written that all the wickedness and, and poverty and evil in the world has come from religion, from God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Seems like Allah, he's okay. You can talk about him all you want. He's wonderful. But I think it really, things back, it really got things backwards, don't they? I think they got the left column and the right column switched. But his righteous acts are going to be revealed. And the wickedness of everything else is going to be revealed as well and destroyed and erased. What an amazing, amazing song we have here. Well, let's make sure we have the melody with it. You know? Steve. Yes, sir. Revelations 5. Mm -hmm. It addresses the, uh, the new song. And it talks about, uh, you know, about what they say in verse 12. Worthy is the land of the slain. 
to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And the whole chapter talks about the hearts and what yes. and it's not just the angels, it's everybody on the earth. On yes. The earth. That's great. Saw or uh, Revelation chapter five. Great. Thank you, Laura. All right. Well, anyways, what a great chapter. Great, great poem. Great song. My the thing that weighs on my heart. Let's, let's make sure we hear the music. You know, let's hear the music. All right. Well, let's close in prayer and. Um, and again, I invite you to go out and take a look at the sukkah that the, the kids have decorated just outside down the hallway and into the courtyard. Our Father and King, thank you so much for all your blessings to us. And Lord, we know that future events are rushing at us. But Lord, in the meantime, we'll leave those events in your hands while we do the work you've put in ours. And when you return, I pray you'd find us faithful at our post, doing our duty, being faithful and at peace. And let us be like the woman of valor in Proverbs 31, for it says there she laughs at the future. So Lord, even though we may live in times that look pretty dreadful, Lord, in our heart, we've got the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And may we be found faithful and rejoicing because we know that the end of the book is an excellent ending, the best of endings. And we look forward to it, Father. We know it'll come in its time. And in the meantime, our times are in your hands, and we'll trust you with them. Thank you for this time together, for the many blessings you provide us in your word. We praise you for it in Yeshua's name.